You're listening to a Skewed Orbit original podcast. Time, weather, and... Always the past. Hi, welcome. If you're watching this, um, we're just doing this straight in Riverside, just raw and real, baby. And I'm so excited for you to hear this episode. So I today sit down with a dear old friend who is a accomplished actor and writer, John Druska. I am so excited. He'd been talking to me for a while about coming on the podcast. So originally, our whole plan was we were going to talk about sobriety and higher power. And well, we ended up talking about comedy and the dream, the Hollywood dream, pretty much the whole time. But I think this episode is really great if you're somebody who is in the process of like renewing your dreams or revisiting old dreams, making new dreams, um, or if you're just a good old comedy fan. So I am excited because, spoiler, before you've even heard this episode, John is coming back once his baby girl is born. Maybe she might have already been born by the time you've heard this. So uh, he's going to be coming back and we're going to do round two with John Druska. And we're going to talk all sobriety and spirituality. But for now, please enjoy this episode with Mr. John Druska. <laughs> How are you? Uh, I'm well. I'm good. Uh, yeah, I've had a good few days. So those kind of lead into today. So I'm good. <laughs> that I don't think I've ever heard it expressed that way. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, when people ask me that, I, I tend to be honest um, and I have to kind of comment on you know how i'm really feeling in that moment um because you know with big picture stuff maybe i'm not doing great or feeling great but um you know today i i got a good night's sleep and um i just took my cold shower uh took my dog on a successful walk and did did a little breathing meditation this morning and uh, helped organize the, I did big manly things and moved the furniture around our under construction nursery as well. So um, I've gotten a lot done today and I was looking forward to this. So yeah, I'm good. Wow. How are you? First of all, uh, well, let me do the same thing back to you. I'm going to move my computer out of screen. There we go. Um, how am I? Um, I am learning how overwhelmed my life is most of the time. Mm. Um, so my husband had hernia surgery like a month ago, so he mm. could not help with the boys pretty much at all as far as like picking them up. And they're yeah. both under two years old or no, I guess Jonah's two and a half. Either way, semantics. They need a lot of picking up. That's like a lot of the job right now. Yeah. Um, and he also had, oh, when he had a vasectomy in like April of last year. And so he had like three days to rest then. And when he had this hernia surgery, so he's had a few weekends to like be away and decompress. Meanwhile, I have not. So this weekend he took our kids to my in-laws and John, the amount of times that I've had to go oh, you're okay. Nothing is on fire. Like you can like put your shoulders back because I'm just mm. like, there's, a, of course, like there's something that needs to be done or somebody needs me or, oh, this video didn't get enough engagement. I should engage more. Or like, there's just so many things that like, yes, my children's like well being is important. And yes, my relationship with my husband is important. And yes, I put a lot of work into my work. And so I wanted to do well, but at the end of the day, like everyone is fed, everyone is fine and nothing is on fire. So I'm just kind of letting my body tell me what it needs to. And that's how I'm doing. Okay. 
All right. I get it. Out of 10. Where are you at out of 10? 10 being like the most wound up? No, 10's good. Oh. How are you? How are you? One is we need medical intervention. 10 is we're oh. in the conversation for like best days of your life. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I mean, I feel like I'm sitting like today. I feel like I'm sitting at like a solid seven, you know? Okay. Yeah. 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 Like all is well, you know? I mean, I feel like best days of your life, you got to save those for the best days of your life. So I'm not going. I, I oversold 10. That, that, that's not what 10 is, but um, t t 10 is like nothing. Nothing has gone wrong. And I get, I have a good feeling nothing will go wrong oh, you know, then we're until I fall asleep tonight. Oh yeah. Then we're sitting at a 10. Oh, word. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, if okay. that's, if that's the reframe, like we're good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's just a lot of like, um, you know, so we left LA, we moved from LA to two years ago. And I was going to ask when I know it happened, but yeah. Okay. okay. I was going to go. Also, sometimes I'll talk to people in LA. They're like, I had no idea you don't live here anymore. Um, but wasn't your first, was your first boy born in California? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So he was an LA baby and I had been feeling the call to move for a while. Um, but I also had never imagined not living in Los Angeles. My whole life was about being able to move there and then being successful enough in order to stay living there. Um, so I was like, this is weird. Like every time I was like, I think we're supposed to go back to Georgia. I'm like, that's fucking weird. I don't know what that's about. And then it just kept happening more and more. And so I finally surrendered. I'm like, all right, let's go see what adventure awaits. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, we've been here. What was that? What was that? Oh, I think because, yeah, like just the frenetic pace of Hollywood. I mean, luckily it is changing a little bit now with like auditions and how much like lag time we have before you get the audition. And then when you have to like, you know, where it used to be, you're trying to work multiple jobs to pay rent, do what you need to do. And then, you know, but then you get an audition that's like 12 pages long and they're like, great, we need this in the next five minutes, you know? And so I think just... <laughs> All of that being wound so tight that every single thing felt like the thing. Like if I didn't get that thing, then I wasn't going to get anything. And I think yeah. if I'm being perfectly honest, like a lot of that is still leaving like my nervous system, my mental health. And so I think sometimes that also contributes to this, like everything has to get done and it has to get done now. Yeah, that's a that's a tough tightrope to walk. I'm I'm sort of I don't know. It it feels like I might be in a transition phase with my 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 pursuit of show business ambitions at, at least in terms of my perception, but it's tough to like do the work, be proud of what you you submit and kind of let go and and let, you know, whatever the universe or what have you take it from there. But it, I think that's very close to also not caring at all, and and almost, and then and then that's very close to, you know, sort of pessimism or or sort of you know self uh, denial or self rejection. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sometimes I'll do a self tape, and I, I almost always do them because I want to. I, I enjoy the challenge. You never know. And I do want to cultivate a good relationship with, with my representative, with my management, my, my manager. Um, but sometimes I'll send one off and I'm like, I'm not right for this. I, I don't look right. I don't even know what I did with the text and whatever. And then other times I'll send one off. Like I got to uh, uh, submit for the bear a couple of years ago, which would have been like, you know, that, 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 that's one of the few times where I'm still like, why, why, why I, you're telling me I'm not perfect for this show. Excuse me. The characters are White Sox fans. Like what the hell man. Um, so it's nice to want things, but I think you have to, it's so hard to not want. It's so hard to want, you know, it's like big picture. It's like, I want success, but I can't want this one job 
too much because of all that that tightness and that mental you know chaos and, and the the hamster wheel of my my own self assessment constantly you know because then you're just involved in self-centeredness and selfishness and then that's not a good place to be yeah i think for me it's funny because i've auditioned more in the last like four months than i have like the last two years that i was in la and oh, that's great yeah, which has been so fun. And I've had same thing, like a very wide variety of stuff. Maybe there was two things where I was like, you know, yeah, it's always there. You don't get the call and you're like, they fucked up. I was perfect for this. Like there's not a lot that we do get that we really are perfect for. Right. And so we definitely hold on to those few, but I've found now, and I think it's probably just the detachment from not being in LA where that energy just surrounds you all of the time. So I'm not walking into a casting office with 14 other people who look like me or worse. They don't look like me and I'm the outlier and everybody feels nervous and everyone's fake talking. Right. And then like, Oh God. Right. And the casting assistant comes out and someone's like, Oh yeah. I saw you at that thing. And I'm just like, Fuck oh, yeah. all and you're like, you. Oh <laughs> This is so awful. Like, I hate it. Like, I just, I hated that. And I mean, I do miss like walking on the Warner Brothers lot or like walking on the Fox lot to like go auditions for things. Like there's something very magical in and of itself for that. I also won't block my blessings. That very well could happen again. But that I definitely miss as far as the aspect of auditioning in LA specifically. But what I love about here, like behind me is where all my self-tape setup is and I feel like now I claim each thing as though I've already gotten it I'm like great so this is mine like this is the role that like I have and again the benefit I know so many of us don't like self-taping but the benefit is you can do it so many times so you really get comfortable with it and versus Absolutely. I feel like a lot of time right like it's there's something that's wildly beneficial about that. And then you don't have to drive all the way to fucking Santa Monica for somebody to go, thank you so much. Right. <laughs> like, Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm pro self tape. Uh, and I actually, you know, so I, I auditioned for a long time and didn't get many gigs and, and finally, you know, talk about self knowledge or, or, or honesty. I was like, you know, I think the missing puzzle piece here is whatever I'm bringing into the rooms, you know, it's like, Mm. I'm, I've never been a bad actor, but I could be better. So I, I, I started taking classes again for the first time since college. And that was like most of 2019, right when my reps dropped me. So I had all this new information and nothing to do with it. And then the pandemic happened. So I've been booking, you know, occasionally here and there, in that post pandemic self tape, uh, you know, environment. Um, and I love it. Yeah. Cause like you said, I had the nerves and you get, you get one or two shots if you're lucky. And then, you know, half the time, you know, I, I, the project comes out and, you know, Danny Pudi is in the role or, you know, Charlie Day is in the role. And it's like, why did you even bother? You know, like, that's, like, well, not me, was- like casting. Like, why did you drag in a guy with no resume when you were gunning for Danny Pudi the whole time? You know, um, well, I know or and- fucking Fred Armisen, you know, it's like, come on, like, why well, waste my time? I mean, 100 percent, because for me, it was always like, um, Casey Wilson, Busy Phillips, and, wow. you, you know, where it's like comedy, like funny best friend, and, or like Jane Lynch, that happened to me a couple times, and, you know, in the, the very, like, <laughs> I'm <raw> sorry, <laughs> I know, and like, I mean, the very raw reality is like, they call all of us in because contractually they have to, they have to keep right. auditioning people while they're waiting for their asks, right, like, they don't get to yeah. stop and wait to see, yeah, if Fred Armisen says yes, they have to still audition people because that's, you know, screen actor guild, that's rules. Um, But I wish I would have known that when I first started auditioning in LA, because I feel like I would have felt so much more free because there was still always this feeling of like, and yes, I believe like for any young actor who's listening and they're like, but I could be the one you have fucking lutely could be. And I definitely believe in that. Um, But yeah, same as you, the longer you've been in the game, you know that like, it's probably very unlikely that they're looking for a no name 
to star in this upcoming show or pilot, right? And it does happen, but I wish I would have known that because I think the freedom to be me, I probably would have even, well, I don't know. That just feels like a fool's errand to be like, I probably would have, but like, I think I just would have had more fun. I think I would have had a lot more fun not feeling that rigidity and I need to give myself credit. I still, I mean, I'm proud of my resume and, you know, continue to work, but I think, um, it definitely takes the fun out of acting. And similarly, like when I returned to classes and I was like, oh yeah, this, I do this because I love doing it. Yeah. Well, again, it's, you know, it's another one of those, you know, you're walking a tightrope between a dichotomy of, of, you know, yeah, that, that, that youthful dream and ambition of like, th th this could be the gig. Um, and it could be, you know, I mean, more realistically, it could be the gig that gets you a half decent agent. And then you're kind of in, in the sausage grinder and, and your career begins to kind of inch along. Maybe it's your big break. You know, we're, we're sold that fiction uh, nowadays or, or for, for younger kids, it's like, you know, maybe your TikTok blows up and you're suddenly signed by WME or whatever. But like you you put that expectation on yourself going into your first, you know, deodorant commercial audition or whatever. And and like you said, it's it's um it takes the fun out of it because and this this is your standard, you know, um home goods philosophy here, but you're focused on the outcome and not, you know, the process getting there. And I like your take on things. And I've, I've been there a little bit myself occasionally where like, okay, I have this audition. It's th this is a performance. There will be a, an audience, maybe an audience of one on the other end of this. It's sort of, you know, it's a submission or a proof of concept that I can do this, you know, for real, but I need to treat this as if uh, it is my, my shot, my shot and I'm on set. And, you know, the great actors are really good at what they do, but they enjoy it too. So it's nice to hear you say that because I think I've accidentally sort of backed into that mentality from time to time but never really consciously. So I'll, I th I'll be thinking about you the next time I get an audition, at least an audition where I, I kind of like the copy and I can instantly, you know, gel with, with the text a little bit. Cause that's a big thing too. Like I said, not to run off on a tangent here, but like sometimes I get, I get sides and I'm like, boy, I don't know. I don't see it. I, I don't even think physically I look like this person is described, but let's give it a shot. And other times I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is my sense of humor or like th this is actually my opinion or how I feel about something. Let's fucking go. You know, I totally agree. And I think that the other thing is where I think, especially because I used to be really resentful of like a lot of the stuff that I would get. And I'm like, they're never going to fucking book me for this. Like I, I just know from casting and I know they're always like, well, we never know. Like you could be the one that we see. And it's like, that's the way we want the role. I'm like, as a writer, can I tell you how little that's ever going to fucking happen? I know exactly how I think this person moves, what they sound like. So I used to have a lot of resentment towards that. And now, I, again, I'm like, what fucking freedom? Because I'm probably not right for this. And then the other thing, which, and, you know, any actor worth their salt knows this, of like, a good casting director will know when you're not right for it, but they still know a good actor. So if you give me what you can give me in something that you're not right for, and I can tell you had fun, you put thought into it, you hit the beats, Right. I know that like technically, OK, you knew where to put your eye line. All right. This person like knows what they're doing. I'm going to remember that person. There's a um, a handful of shows here. And I'm like, I don't know how many more times they're going to call me back for the show and not book me. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but again, where I'm like, how cool they keep calling me back. They clearly like me. So they're like, we know that we're going to fit her in somewhere. And, and then if nothing else, I'm like, great, you know, like once, once a week I get to do this like fun read for this silly Hulu show. How fun. And I think that the other thing I wish more young actors knew, or even a seasoned actors like us remember, which is so many great actors just aren't right for a lot of the stuff that's 
up at any given time, right? We know for a while to be like, oh, we want all true crime stuff or, oh, we want all vampire stuff. Now we want all mockumentary comedy workplace. Like it also just may not be your season. Yeah. It, it may not be your season for something that you could potentially be right for. Yeah. That, that leads me into something that, that is going to kind of be a counterpoint to, you know, for those people who prefer in person, but those acting classes I took back in the day were with a really great teacher named Stan Kirsch. And he, he ran a really good studio. He came out of Alice, not Allison Jones. Um, the other famous like comedy school. Uh, it doesn't even matter. Hopefully you edit this part out. <laughs> um, but Stan was a, a really brilliant guy and he was on um, the Highlander series back in the nineties. But he said, you know, one of his mantras was if you don't book the role, book the room. Uh, which is exactly what you're talking about. And there are some people who, you know, that that environment of chit-chatting in the waiting room and and like schmoozing with, you know, the front desk intern or whatever, you know, some people get off on that and they kind of thrive under those circumstances. And then I have heard comments here and there, you know, whether it's some, some reel on Instagram or some Q&A, but like, Casting directors, sometimes they'll kind of let let the mask slip and they'll admit, you know, sometimes they're just really captivated by someone's vibe, you know, when they walk in the room. And that may be what gets them the role or more likely the room. So I want to give a little bit of creep, not, not a little bit. I, I want to respect the opinion of people who prefer in-person auditions, but you know, then I wonder, you know, what, what is your, as you were talking about, Rachel, what is your day-to-day -day life like? I mean, if, if you've got all the time in the world to spend three hours driving and parking and waiting to spend three minutes in a popcorn commercial audition, that's good for you. But the rest of us got to bang out these self tapes at like 10, 15 PM with like a really trusted friend who's on zoom reading with us. And then we got to immediately edit and ship and, and then try to get some sleep. And I don't even have fucking kids yet, <laughs> you know, I mean, so, so self tapes are, are great. And I, I think in the theatrical space, it's, you know, they're doing both now, but I'm still getting mostly self tapes. And, and I, I appreciate that personally. I do too. And I think that like, I mean, there's pros and cons to everything, right? Like there's definitely been where I had callbacks and being in the room for that reason, being a comedian and knowing how to throw the ball back and forth. I know that I put myself in a good position, but it's like, you know, and, and that's so much of, it's this fine line too, right? Because that's the other fine line of acting is you don't want to be too excited and too chummy, but then you also want to look like you want to be there. And that is... <sighs> such a, I mean, that's just fucking hard to do as like humans, right? How many times do I have to show up to something and be like, let me look like I want to be here right now, you know? So it's like, yeah, that's, that is even like a whole other skill. And I don't know. I mean, for me personally, it's like, I know that I'm not, I'm not done with all uh, like, again, I thought it was so interesting. I was like, oh, isn't this interesting that I've been auditioning more here recently than I did for, you know, yeah, a lot of like the second half of 2019 into 2020, like pre-pandemic. Um, and I'm like, yeah, this is what I want. And I get excited about it. But it'll be interesting to see where where it goes. Um, the other thing, and I'm interested to hear this from you too, because so much of some of the times that we get stuff and we're reading it, I'm like, who the fuck is making this? This is dog shit. It's not good. Like just as a writer, right? Like you think about all the like pilots and stuff that you've written and like things that you like want to submit and like nothing is getting made, but then you're reading this stuff and it's like, this is just bad. It's bad copy. Like this is not on me. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, it, it, especially comedy. Um, there's a few things I notice, uh, you know, just like I'm a bit, I'm, I'm a, how do I say this? I'm sort of a, um, an art. Well, no, I, I don't need to put a word in front of it. I'm kind of a hipster when it comes to a lot of things in that I don't like 
you know, derivative stuff. I, I don't like tired tropes and things like that. And an example, and th this is really outdated, but I felt this way like 10 years ago, like the word ginormous was played out a long time ago. Um, and, and, and that's the best example I can think of, of like when I see, you know, it's not that your joke is bad in a script, but it's like, oh, I'm, you know, whatever. I'm so hungry. I could, you know, eat a horse. You know, the, the, the punchline of your comedic line is so boring and tired and certainly has been said before. And, you know, that's, that's one example of, of what you're talking about. I'm just like, really this, this this script's been through multiple revisions and nobody's like punched this up yet like what are you giving notes on you know and then like especially with this cultural uh you know shift it feels like of you know gender roles are changing and gender uh uh you know, show, you know, showing women characters is changing in a good way. And, and you, know, men, you know, men can be sensitive now and men can go to therapy now and all of this sort of stuff, which I'm all for, you know, I go to therapy, but there's still so many male characters of like horrifying douchebag best friends. And it's like, and, and the prime example of this is again, old so it's all kind of out of date already but it's rob cordry's character in hot tub time machine this dude is such an you know an unpalatable piece of shit it's like nobody would put up with this and the fact that these guys are still i mean you know th th this is this is as old as the argument of like how does a schlubby fat loser have a hot tight blonde wife in sitcoms but it's like why are these characters still out there when they were there's nothing likable about them except for the fact the main character was friends with them back in high school which we never see on the show you know um so yeah i don't know how we got on that <laughs> on that tangent no, but no i think it's all interesting and i you know from like a writer's perspective and i i think that I actually think that's what made the bear such a great going back to that such a great show was like, Oh, these are complex people. And I feel like they're not always likable. In fact, out of context, a lot of those scenes, these people are highly unlikable. Um, but they're so well written and there's such depth to them that you want them to win and you also see that their their fallibility and you also see their um i think they're like resiliency in the face of like none of this should be working and i think i don't know i like that was a show where i was like oh yeah this is this you know people always say like now i'm revisit i'm revisiting some old work that I wrote and I'm trying to sit down and be like, what is something that I don't see that I would want to see? Like what feels real and exciting. And there's something to be said for like soapy things that do well, right? Like a Bridgerton or something like there's a time and place for that as entertainment. But I also think that there's, we've left out a very, and maybe it's just like kind of where we are right now, but you know, do you like a 24 depends on the title but okay yeah um but just I, I i guess i mean like that that type of where i'm like i feel like we're seeing real characters and that just comes for me for like from like sketch comedy just for me where i'm like i want to see people actually like experiencing something and like moving through something like a um a coming of age uh piece will forever be my favorite coming and that could be you know, it doesn't have to be like teenagers, but just anything where you're watching something, someone get to the other side of something is just, and it's funny is really interesting to me. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I wasn't dogging the bear earlier, but it's like they, you know, that show benefits from being, I mean, it's not, I, I wouldn't call that a comedy, honestly, you know, yeah. um, I mean, it's, it's sort of a half hour format, but it's kind of a dramedy or just a straight drama, um, which, which most programs are nowadays. There are not, 
even in the streaming space, you know, you, you, you've always got your, your big network multicams, which are what they are, you know, they're, they're okay once in a while, I guess, but like, there is no comedy really anymore. It feels like, um, so that's, that's one thing, you know, the, the bear can, can excavate those, uh, those, those depths of character, you know, through dramatic tropes that, you know, really the Sopranos pioneered with, uh, or, or the, the, the post Sopranos world of drama pioneered with flashbacks and, and, you know, time jumps and all this other stuff, you know, as, you know, as a comedy writer, you know, comedies tend to not get that much leeway with, with narrative structure until you've had a couple seasons under your belt and you do the flashback episode. And as actors, you know, we're not getting, a season's worth of content. We're getting one or two scenes where the guy I'm supposed to portray sucks. And we're not given, you know, the, the character breakdowns are rarely actually giving us insight into their emotional background. It's like, this is how tall he is. And this description of his character is verbatim one of his lines on page three, you know? So, um, it's it's tough to trust that process uh, on the audition side of things or or trust that outcome or the plan that the writers have when all you get is schlocky, tired, overdone, unoriginal copy. What are your favorite comedies? I'm interested to know. Uh feature or TV or does it matter? Doesn't matter. My favorite movie of all time is Ghostbusters, the original. Um, also, uh, loosely in my top 10, Caddyshack, The Blues Brothers, Hot Fuzz, um, TV. You know, I, I, I grew up in the 90s, so the uh, early days, Simpsons and Seinfeld. Um, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. I, I was an early adopter, night one, episode one on FX. I, I remember the night well. Uh, I'm trying to think what, oh, I love Veep on HBO. Um, that comes to mind. Uh, so yeah, so that that's that. And I, I think, you know, when you consider my sensibilities, I love the absurdity of Seinfeld. Um, and I, I, I didn't realize until I was, an adult that I really steal a lot of Jason Alexander's uh, mannerisms. I mean, I'm, I really bite his style as George Costanza when I'm acting or when I was doing sketch at least. But, uh, you know, I like the absurdity of Seinfeld uh, and sort of the intermingling of plots that I think they did better than others. Um, I love the intelligence of Veep. I mean, that's a show where everybody is horrible to each other, but it's in that world of politics and, you know, ostensibly everything matters and, and, and we, you know, you have to have that, that you know, harsh outer shell to survive. So you can kind of forgive it in a, in a traditional comedy sense. And the writing is so good. You know, that's an example of the, in, you know, you never know what punchline is coming, you know, it's, it, it could be anything. And, uh, I, you know, I, I actually know one of the um, kind of supporting characters who was on that show and he would tell me that, you know, they would they would film the scene one way and then they'd say, OK, we, here, here's our B option for the punchline. So try it this way. Here's our C option. So they had, you know, four or five, you know, just blistering punchlines lined up and ready to go. You know, so so Veep is a prime example of like really original, unexpected writing, in my opinion. Um, and then Sonny, I'll always have a sweet spot for I think it's. I liked it when it was a, a smaller world, you know, when it was about the bar and, and so much of the comedy was, was so subtle in, in, you know, where somebody's eyes go, you know, when someone else is talking or, you know, someone's mouth dropping open, but, but no words coming out, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll always remember the, um, when they find the dead body in the bar and, or God, no, is, is that the episode? No, it's it's the very first episode. The gang gets racist where Charlie is very awkward and he starts like tapping a lamp like in the ceiling. Like they're, they're, the subtlety of performance in Sonny is, is, is a master class for an aspiring comedic actor, in my opinion. Well, that was also a show, though, I feel like everybody was having fun. And 
And I would argue, I think that like you, that doesn't, doesn't mean like every day, but I feel like you can, there's a, it just shines differently. I think, I think Veep is the same way um, where you have seasoned comedic actors. I mean, you have people that have really, you know, have their 10,000 hours, no exact, I mean, it's to me, like not to be overwrought, but like, I actually think Veep plays like a really beautiful symphony. Like everybody knows exactly where to go. And it, um, in fact, we're like, if I rewatch episodes, that has to be a show. Now I was like, maybe I'll rewatch them tonight. Um, that I have to like sit down and pay attention to. Like, I'm like, I, oh, yeah. I, I can't really like come in and out of it. Just even the, just the pacing and, and that frenetic energy, you know, you kind of feel like you have to be a part of, but I just was curious. Cause, um, yeah, I think, you know, there's two things where it's like, I try not to take comedy specifically and make it too precious. But at the same time, I think it's like one of the most beautiful things that we have as humans is the ability to make each other laugh. And, and really at the heart of comedy, right. Is a familiar surprise. And meaning that like, we don't want to know what's coming, but in order for there to be a punchline, we have to be able to like, people who listen to the show a lot will always hear me say this, but like, I used to think that getting a laugh on stage just made like ego Rachel feel really good of like, okay, all right, we're good at something. We're really funny. And that's true. And also now, especially with doing stand up and talking about more real life things that are real for me, hearing a laugh feels so good. Cause I'm like, Oh, thank God I'm not alone. Like if I can make all of you laugh, that means there's this recognition and there's this understanding of the human condition and that's why I just really love now, like, yeah, the the unexpected but familiar surprise of we've all signed on board that we've all agreed this is a comedy or this is a stand-up show, this is a sketch show, that the payoff will be that we will laugh. But the mm-hmm. there's also the promise of we don't know when it's coming. And there's not a lot of other things that exist like that. And in in some ways, I think pulling myself out of Los Angeles, out of Chicago, out of like just all of these places that I've always put myself in where I've like fermented in comedy and doing it alongside with some of like the funniest people in the world. (laughs) And now being in a wildly different environment, there's sometimes like grief that I feel of like, you know, I miss being in the back of like the you know bus with other people in second city and like we're just doing bits back and forth we're like in the green room at you know io and (laughs) i miss those spaces but there's also been something about having to reclaim i know this all sounds like very dramatic but i guess it is but it's also just the reality of like there's been something really beautiful for me about reclaiming like comedy or like how i want to do comedy now if that makes sense. Like, how can I take everything that I've been influenced by, everyone I've worked with, all of the things that I love, and how can I bring something new to the table now as like my own just kind of like personal evolutions changed to like my point of view on life has changed. And how can I, how can I kind of fall in love with comedy again? Because I I think I've just done it for so long that You know, it's kind of like in a marriage. Sometimes you just take your partner for granted. And then I'm like, oh, my God, but you're so great. And I'm so sorry that I ever took you for granted. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I I can I can uh, wax dramatic on this for a minute. Yeah, I mean, there there is there is an honor in comedy because laughter is involuntary joy. I mean, a, a real laugh is is hard to fight um and you know think about when you've been in a circumstance where you know whatever it's a funeral or it's something it's a doctor's visit and you really should not laugh but it's it's hard to fight that you know and you know you could maybe bring somebody to a comedy show who's like deeply clinically depressed and and you're not going to get through to them but most people if they're having a a hard day or a bad day or they don't want to be there or they're stuck on a shitty date or whatever they're going to laugh and, and, and if you're good at that and, and you can, you know, coax involuntary joy out of somebody, um, you know, you, that, that's a good thing. And, and I think I've many times in my life, I've looked back and I've thought like, 
oh, you know, what if I'm 85 and I'm on my deathbed and I never, you know, I, I never got my billboard on Sunset Boulevard or I never I never even quit my day job. You know, I, I never even made a living off of show business. You know, what if? And it's like, well, I tried, you know, I did my best. I did a lot of good work. And I, and I know from what other people have told me, uh, including your friend and mine, Evan Watkins, um, you know, I, I, I had that run much as you did, you know, for, for 10 years at the IO, I put up a lot of really good sketch sometimes to really packed houses. And, you know, those people had a good night out, you know, they had a good Sunday night and I was a part of that. And, um, and that was, that was, you know, deeply fulfilling and a lot of fun. Um, so I've, uh, you know that doesn't pay the bills, but that does make me feel like I'm, I'm living a life I can be proud of. Oh, amen. And I've also just like my whole body is like I have so many goosebumps because I think that's also something that I I wish I could go back and tell younger Rachel, which is like, don't buy into what everybody else is saying. You're allowed to have the most fucking fun doing all of this and you don't have to book a single thing and it doesn't take away from your worthiness or how good you are at this. Like some, just sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, you know? And then if I look at it from, I don't know if this is something you subscribe to, but for me, it's like, if I look at it through a spiritual lens, I'm like, some people have to go on the ride of fame and some people don't. We're all learning different lessons and things that people have to go through and also going through you know mega that sunset boulevard like billboard fame I'm like that's a whole other ride and I think that the most beautiful thing that any of us as true artists it's like can you enjoy it and love it the whole way through and if so it's like I think that's the win and I, I, I used to just say things like that. I'm like, oh, isn't that cute? And it's like, yeah, but also when are you going to book something? But now I really do feel that way. I'm like, I am really good at what I do. You are really good at what you do. And like being able to, and that's not about like, look how good I, but just like how great to feel like good at your craft. Because I feel like acting, comedy, these things that it seems like you're, we're always waiting for someone else to say, here's your role. You're good enough now. And mm -hmm. there's not a lot of other <clears throat> things that exist like that. Like you don't have to be the best pilot to be able to fly a plane for Delta, <laughs> you know, like just all of, they're like, you clean teeth. Like no one else has clean teeth. Like you are a true dentist. Like I think because of the, the accolade or the production of comedy of movies of film sometimes we kind of get too caught up in that and I feel like that's been another gift of being outside of that for a while is is being like and even going back to Evan Watkins I'm like that is one of the hardest working funniest like most fun people I've ever worked with and you know it's like I think about all these other people and plenty of people I'm sure mutual friends that we have that like are legitimate like working working actors if I said their name at a dinner party other people would know who they are and it's like I don't think that they're any better or more accomplished than other friends of ours that have that are still like grinding and doing the work right and I I don't know that's just kind of the place that I'm I'm at with the work myself which is like I just want to like love it again and I feel like it will love me back and I want to experience what that feels like because for so long it was doing the work in hopes of being chosen. And now I want to do it again just because I love doing it. Yeah. I'm trying to jot down. There's like five, five things I want to also say based on what you just said, but like what, what, well, yeah, what, what comes to mind is this, and maybe this is kind of off topic, but you know, I've heard it said, um, if God really hates you, he'll give you exactly what you want. Um, oh. and I, I do think oftentimes, um, 
you know, because I, I moved to LA and 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 you know, and I, I still have these ambitions, but I had you know the, a big head and big dreams and you know a, a list movie star aspirations and that sort of thing. And let's just say, not too you know, late. It's not too I mean, late. I, uh, you're right. Yeah, they're they're not gone. They're okay. made, they're kind of different different size and different shape a little bit. You know, I no longer want to be rich and famous. I would like to be successful and financially stable. Amen. Which 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 is almost the same thing in show business because if you're a successful actor, you're probably famous. But anyway, um, but let's say lightning strikes and I'm uh you know I I'm I'm a list and I'm 26 or 27 years old. I mean, you got social media. We don't know what social media really is yet. I'm still drinking hard, you know, carousing, acting a fool, uh, you know. Put it, writing things on Facebook that are cringe to say the least. You know, I was never like a bigot or anything like that, but just writing opinions nobody asked for, saying things. You know, we were us of the Facebook generation. I'm the same age as Mark Zuckerberg. Like, we didn't think any of that really mattered. You know, um, it's just showing my ass in one way or another. And I, I th th that pressure would have gotten to me, you know, my, my addictions may have gotten to me. Like I, I couldn't handle fame, you know, I, and the whole time I was a good actor and I still am, you know, so it was, and I think I was a little bit, I, I'm kind of good at realizing these things in the moment. I was like, this, this really is the life. You know, I, I hate when people say um, the McConaughey thing, um, live in the dream or whatever, you know, I don't like that. But like to be 25, 26, you know, performing, you know, on a weekly or a monthly basis, we had that clubhouse at the IO, you know, the beer is cheap. There's tons of friends. We're making people laugh. You know, I'm, I'm barely paying my rent and I'm young and I'm in Hollywood and I've been talking about Hollywood for years and years. And I live in Hollywood on a day to day basis. It was the shit. And now, you know, I'm almost I'm well, I'm 39 and a half and fame would still completely throw my head into the stratosphere. But I have you know, I have some wisdom. I have more mature points of view. I don't play fast and loose with my social media anymore. And I'm, a, um, a, you know, I'm, I'm a nicer guy. I'm a better person. I was never mean or cruel or, or violent with anybody, but I was selfish. I used to get off on kind of being an antagonist and like, poking the bear and kind of getting in fights. And, and you know, when, when, when you're loaded, you know, you got a loose mouth and you say, you know, cruel shit to, to whoever, to strangers or to people you don't like, or to, you know, at, you know, or talk a lot of shit behind people's backs. You know, I, I was like any young, you know, uh, overly testosterone man. And now I, I have been working on my art this whole time, but I'm, you know, luckily the, you know, over the last five years, give or take, I've been working on myself too. And and now I'm the sort of person who could handle success better and, you know, dare I say, deserves it more than, you know, some cocky shithead who's who's on, on the boulevard in 2009. I feel that way all the time. I feel like had all of the things that were false starts for me, all the things that were supposed to go, and there were a handful of them. And I look back and I'm like, Thank fucking God they didn't go because at least now I'm consciously creating all of the beautiful things in my life and all of the things that I consciously created that I didn't need to get put my foot in. Right. Versus, yeah, it's like when I was at IO and, you know, taking down five IPAs, like that's what I needed to do on a Tuesday night. Like, you know, it's just, there would have been no discernment of how, to operate and what a sad, what a sad way to go. So I, you know, and, and I think so much of my vitality now and my feeling of like, 
and I really believe this. I don't know if other people might roll their eyes, but I'm like, I feel like I can still have whatever the fuck I want. Meaning like if I really put the work in and decide what it is that I want now, obviously that's within, I'm, you know, I'm not going to join the WNBA or anything tomorrow, but like, yeah, within, I think that way about hockey, like I, I'm not going to win a Stanley cup. Right. 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 Like there's some <laughs> things we can go, that ship has probably sailed. But I mean, as far as like, I think again, that wisdom and those lessons learned of, you know, what to do and how to do it. And, and I also think, you know, yeah, I don't know. I, I've, um, there's a project that I'm working on. Um, that's all about talking about like, can you be in a process of like, I say healing, everybody says different of like self-development or whatever, but basically like, can you be aware of who you are and a good human and still be really fucking funny? Because I feel like so much of what we see out there is like, I mean, the narrative is changing a lot, but it's still like all of our, you know, idols, everyone that we we're like that that's how funny I want to be like I grew up like you know Chris Farley was everything to me or yeah. you know all of these people and it's like and they same thing like fame destroyed them or they weren't ready for it or you know so many of us are are just kind of um very sensitive people anyway to do this work and then throw any sort of trauma or addiction or disease on top of that and like you know so I, I I'm just curious for you like yeah how has that doing the work for yourself, evolving, choosing yourself, choosing to do that work. How has that inner work affected your outlook on the work, whether that's like stuff that like you write and like what you're producing or wanting to get up or like the things that you go after, like has that changed your sensibilities towards comedy at all? Or you just wake up not hungover anymore? <laughs> I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe more the latter. Um, I'm trying to think my, my sensibilities towards comedy. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know that my, my sense of humor, um, has changed much, you know, when I would, and, and, you know, j just to come out and say it, I used, you know, I, I consider myself an alcoholic and I, I used to drink, you know, hard and heavy. And the one thing that I always still was able to kind of do was the, the stuff at the IO, you know, I made, um, I made my writers meetings, you know, I, uh, I, I, I know for a fact I've blacked out on that stage, but only once or twice, if that makes it better, <laughs> you know, um, I would, I was still a good performer. And like I said, I, I was not, you know, to the people I cared about who were the people on my sketch teams and my friends, I was a good guy. You know, I, I, I was a jovial drunk, you know, I was a good colleague. I take notes. Um, I give notes. I, I thrive in constructive criticism. So, you know, I, I don't think there was a big, a huge, you know, upheaval in, in my creative sensibilities when I quit drinking and got sober, but certainly there's a, a big uptick in uh, productivity. You know, I mean, I, I've, written, <laughs> yeah. I've written 10, I mean, hell, I, I stopped, we, we, well, I don't know about you. I shouldn't speak for you. I stopped really doing sketch for the most part in 2018. And I've written, you know, 12 or 14 feature film scripts since then. You know, I've written two seasons of, of my dream project, which is a sitcom. And, is that your um, bowling project? Yeah, Roland. Yep. Um, yeah, thanks. Th thank, th thank you. Thanks for noticing that. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I, I, read, I, I think I, I read your pilot. I think you did because yeah. I gave it to Evan and then he brought it to like your, your big bear cabin getaway that you yeah. did with Redford. And there was like a hard copy going, getting, getting <laughs> passed around the fire pit or something, which is an, an, an amazing feeling to have. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I appreciate the question, but I guess the fact that I've never really thought about it and I don't have a great answer for you. I think the answer is no. I, I think yeah. deep down inside underneath my disease, was, you know, kind of my heart and my creative soul all along. Um, but now, yeah, I can get up at 
nine on a Saturday morning and, and bang out five or 10 pages, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. So, so what are you doing to keep, uh, to keep your like creative juices going now? If you're not doing, do you do stand up or no? No, I've dabbled uh, very little. Uh, in fact, I, I kind of want to ask you about that because I feel like with stand up being alone and you, you, I just wrote down the word selfish, which is not the right word, but you have to come so much from within yourself. I, I kind of want to pick your brain about that in a little bit, but, but to answer your question. So no, I've, I've really never done stand up really, um, yeah. you know, the belly room a few times, that sort of thing. Um, I am at groundlings currently I'm, I'm working up through the groundlings track. So I'm, I'm in their writing program. I'm waiting for the, the second, whatever it's called advanced lab or something like that. So that's cool. And that's really kind of fired my love of, of the art form again, because, you know, to, to, to start at groundlings, you have to do improv. And for a long time, my ego and my shitty attitudes were in the way. And I was like, first of all, I know how to do improv. Second of all, improv's fucking lame, you know? So I put it off for way too long, which is foolish. Um, and I finally started doing the improv track and then I got into the writing track. So now I'm finally writing sketch again, which has always been my, my wheelhouse. Um, but I last uh, finished a class back around Memorial day last year. And I've had crazy writer's block, uh, with regards to, you know, TV or movie scripts and that sort of thing. And I haven't written much, uh, which is okay because I have this backlog of material that, you know, I could still bring to, you know, a meeting or something or a general or something like that. But what I've been writing lately, I'm glad you asked. So I am horribly, horribly addicted to backgammon. Okay. Are you familiar with that? I, yeah, I do not, don't ask me anything about the rules, but I'm very familiar with the aesthetic of backgammon. Perfect. Okay. So this is the tabletop board game with yes. dice not rackets and shuttlecocks sure yes a lot of people think i'm talking about badminton so okay. anyway i've been running this instagram page it's called pure backgammon it's fun it's strategy it's a little bit of uh, humor and memes and stuff but i just started writing a quarterly uh absurdist one sheet zine cool all about backgammon um, it's called Tableau's Esoterica. It's all analog. There's no digital copies. And I'm, I'm getting a, a few subscriptions here and there from around the country. And it's a combination, you know, so the, the simple way to put it is it's Mad Magazine meets Thomas Paine's Common Sense, but okay. back in. Okay. That's so the simple way of putting it. Yeah. So there's poetry, there's essay, there's a lot of whimsy, you know, there's fake ads for like backgammon products that aren't real. You know, there's cart, I'm drawing cartoons for it and that sort of thing. Um, but I've really just gone all in on it. You know, I, I print it on a legal page, you know, 14 inches long, so I can cram a lot of content in there. And it's just, it's really fulfilling, you know, because I, I think about backgammon way more than most people, unless they are professional backgammon players. So it's a great way to sort of decompress this weird obsession I have with this hobby, but I'm also creative and I get to be creative in a multitude of media. Like I said, you know, I'm writing poetry, I'm writing haiku, I'm writing, you know, essays that are essentially nonfiction. Then I'm writing, you know, other short stories that are purely fiction and, and they're silly and they're funny and, um, and I'm sending these sample issues out to backgammon clubs and like known guys on the world stage of backgammon and they're responding, you know, pretty well to it. So on one hand, I have writer's block in terms of like my career, but on the other hand, I'm really happy because I'm, I'm doing, you know, sort of creative literary writing, um, which I feel like is a nice uh, homage to my father who was an English professor and, and he passed away, you know, coming up on two years here. Mm. Um, and, uh, it's, it's just fun. It's, it's fun to be a little silly and, 
even with my comedy writing, I'm, I'm a guy who just believes in escapism. You know, I mean, I, th I think you touched on this earlier about how, oh, how Bridgerton kind of has its place, you know, just some good old fashioned entertainment, you know, that's where I am with, with comedy. I, I don't want to write a gritty dramedy where everybody's got a backstory. You know, I want fucking five jokes a page and I want to get paid a lot of money to sell one of these things, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling here, but that's what I'm working on now. My backgammon zine. I love that. I love that <laughs> so much for the fact that like, I mean, cause here's my thing of like, I love anything super niche and like, dare I say nerdy, like anything because, or really what I say is I love subcultures because Perfect. they're, they're so fascinating to me. Even like, I don't have to know anything about like the subculture at all, but there is something so cool to me because the way people interact and like the linguistics and the, the unspoken rules and like just all of that is so interesting to me because I think so often like each of our worlds, even when we have like a lot of expansion in our world, like we kind of only have like can hold space for about three things, right? So whether that's like fitness, your family, and then, you know, maybe like you're into running or whatever, like we really can only hold space for so many things. And so being able to kind of like, I think is why I, I love documentaries so much because it's an opportunity to like dip my toe into the way other people live um, without having to leave my house. So I, yeah. you know, like... I think that's really, really, I think that's really neat. And yeah, I, I think briefly uh, not to tell you your business, but I, I wonder, cause I, I love that, that, um, that sensibility of like, you, you just appreciate the concept of subcultures. And it makes me think of this, uh, you know, common internet, uh, joke that people will leave in the comments of like, I wish I cared about anything in my life as much as this person cares about blank, you know? Um, yep. Yeah, people getting together and liking something is is a good thing, and it should you know as long as it's not you know something criminal or horrifying, it it should be uh you know celebrated and kind of respected. <clears throat> yeah, I think so because there's um we I was in the oh I was in the grocery store with my son Jonah who's two and a half. And there was another little boy and he had panda pajamas on and Jonah, we go to like the zoo all the time. He loves pandas. And so we're in there and he's so fascinated with this other little boy who has panda pajamas on. And every time we went past and he was like, mommy, panda. And so then we ended up near this boy and then, you know, we were just like kind of chit chatting and just offhandedly, I was like, yeah, isn't that neat? Sometimes we meet other people who like the things that we like mm. and and one of my favorite things about having children is that it's the most simple life lessons you get to like hear yourself say again, like being able to hear that. And I was like, oh yeah, because we have this world now that's so polarizing of like, if you don't agree with every single thing that I agree and you don't agree exactly how I agree. And then if you haven't done anything about it, then we're not friends. Yeah. And while yes, there's merit to progress and all of that, I think we're blocking a lot of our progress by holding people accountable to things that like we couldn't even be held accountable to. And so just hearing myself say that to him of like, yeah, it's really neat when you find somebody who like likes the things that you like. And it's like, oh yeah, sometimes like that's all we can hope for. It's like, and then that takes me back to the the comedy of, of it all of like saying something on stage that I that I thought of and and having enough goal, right? That that word selfish, having that the goal to be like, maybe somebody else will find this funny, right? Or they will, um, this will resonate with them. And I think probably, you know, if I was really to like, you know, be clinical about it, I'm sure part of it is please validate the things that I see and like what my awareness is. Like, I don't want to feel alone. Um, and then the other part of it is, I think is, um, this sounds overwrought, but I really do mean it of like, is it's the way that I can like serve other people too. And be like, here's the way I see the world. And if somebody laughs, I'm like, okay, yeah, me too. Me too. So it's the same thing. Yeah, like I mommy, he's wearing Panda pajamas. 
Yeah, I, I want to circle back to that because I, I didn't really say, you know, the right thing. But it's like basically the 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 my thesis, my conclusion of my thesis here is that it's just it, it's good for you. And it's refreshing to hear that your it, it's kind of seems like your end goal with with when you're performing stand up is to create, you know, a bond with the audience or, you know, get people thinking about whatever it is, maybe, a, you know, a, to a degree, a, a hardship or, you know, an, an uncomfortable, you know, conversation um, and, and connect and, 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 you know, to normalize these different issues that strike you as being, you know, profound or notable or funny, you know, and I think, and I'm not trying to, to dump or throw shade on, you know, LA or on anybody's ambitions. But I think a lot of, you know, it's like your goal is to get people to relate to the content while laughing. And I think a lot of stand or some standups, um, and I don't know all the drama about, for example, this guy, Matt Reif, but there, there's, there's a, a, a through line of standup comedy to this day where it's like, I don't, I, I don't want you to relate to me. I want you to agree with me. And those are two different, two extremely different things. Um, so it's just nice to hear your perspective of like, you know, it feels like comedy and laughter is still the main point, but your driving ethos behind it is commendable. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I do. Thank you. Thank you for seeing me. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I have to ride that balance too, right? I have to remember that sometimes people are going through the hardest week of their life and they just bought tickets to this thing and they're like, all right, I guess I'm going to get out of my house and go to this thing. And it doesn't need to be like, hey, have you thought about, you know, like your spiritual identity or have you thought about your childhood trauma? Like it, it doesn't need to be right for a while. We had all those specials from comics and everybody was like, why does every comedian think that it has to be a Ted talk? And I think I don't subscribe to that. I mean, to me, comedy, if you make a room of people laugh, like that's undeniable. So it doesn't matter what your content was. It doesn't matter if you don't like them. Clearly they made an entire room of people laugh. So it's undeniable. Right. Um, which is the other thing I like about comedy is even if I'm like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't like that guy's comedy at all, but I'm like, He's got three Netflix specials or whatever it is. I'm like, clearly there are people that there's something about it that they connect to. So I it just, you know, it is what it is. But I think for me, it's trying to find that line between um, sharing and like teaching. Like I think on stage in comedy, like it's never my time to like teach, like here's what I've figured out about the world. But I think yeah. it is, it is the time for me to go, here's how I see the world. And maybe you see it that way too. And I think approaching it in that way. And, and I also think, you know, that's the other gift of doing comedy for uh, a long time, which is you learn how to nest certain jokes. So I know that I need to get the audience on my side. Let's say I go out to do stand up and it's, pre it's predominantly like golf bros. Okay. They're probably <laughs> not listening to the Rachel LaFour show. You know what I mean? I'm probably yeah. not the entertainment they, that they were looking for. And so it's not pandering, but it's knowing who my audience is. Okay, so I'm probably going to do some old sex jokes because I'm like, okay, you know, Tim, Tom, and Matt are really going to find this funny. And then I'll have their attention. So then they're more likely to go on the ride with me. They're more likely to be open to things that they would not have otherwise been open to because that's the thing about laughter. We don't have to be best friends. But if I can make you laugh, you've dropped your arms. And so exactly. now we're listening. Now we're having a conversation, right? Yeah. That, and, and that, you know, that's because I think about this, you know, because I love stand up and I've, I've given it a shot and, you know, I, I think content wise and um, reaction wise, I, you know, I, I was good at it, but I just, I, I lack, I, I lack a lot of things about it. And one of the ways is the, is the way my, my brain is wired. So, you know, to, to come up with a comedic circumstance, I need dialogue. I need feedback and characters talking and doing things together and that sort of thing. Stand up being so singular. Um, I, uh, you know, you, you are able to, and it's not an easy thing to do as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, but like 
you're able to, you know, like I said, you, you have sort of a point or a goal or at least a hope with your content. Whereas my experience writing sketch, it's got to be funny. You know, it's got to be funny enough in the room to get approved to be in the show. And then it's got to be fun, you know, and, and I want to give every character good lines and things like that. So my, um, and, and, you know, I don't know, maybe this limits me as a screenwriter, but like my uh, ethos is always like, you know, is this entertaining? Is this funny? It doesn't have to be as broad as possible. Um, it, it shouldn't be exclusionary content, but I do like a good joke for in comedy terms, the 1%, uh, a yeah. one percenter as we call it. And may maybe we need to clarify what that means, but <laughs> I, I've just never thought about like, Oh, I hope people, I hope people really resonate with my message of um, a guy who has a per very particular favorite hot sauce brand, you know, that, right. that that's how far my comedy goes, which I'm proud of. Cause like I said, it's funny, but it's just interesting to talk to somebody else uh, and somebody else in a, in a sort of a parallel uh, medium like stand up, um, who is doing more than just feeding your ego and, you know, feeling really fucking good for those, those five or 12 minutes that you got the microphone in your hand, you know? I mean, hopefully. Yeah. But I, I mean, that's that's the other thing though because I, I, it's it's funny when you talk about like it has to be funny in the room and I just always think of Bill Kessler shout out Bill also from Redford because yes because Bill I could always tell was my barometer like if I could make him laugh then I was like this is undeniably funny because mm. no one on Redford really shared the same like comedic sensibilities, but I play really big, broad, funny characters. So I was great, a great addition to everyone else's writing skills because I could suit a lot of those things. But the, I mean, it was also just like, I came out of it from touring with second city where we were doing grounded two person scenes. And most of these guys were game guys, right? We're going to play the game. How do we heighten the game, which is just a different way of doing it. But I do often think of a lot of the experience that I had in that room because I want to play to what it is that I do best. But that's what I was saying earlier too, of like, I also want to take with me a little bit of everything that I learned from everybody who I believe to be at the top of their game, whether even, even if they would maybe not consider themselves to be that, that in that place now, but when I was experiencing those things with them. So, you know, often if I'm working on a new thing, I will go through that barometer of, is there a better punchline? Is there a funnier, you know, reference? Is there a more heightened version of this? Is there, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it's good for all of it. One of my, we don't longer write together, but one of my longtime writing partners, Casey Navarro, we wrote together for like 10 years. And that was a thing that she always got on me about too. Cause I, I tend to be the person that it's like, but it does need to land. And she's like, but does it, it doesn't need to, what we need on this page is a laugh. So that's what we're going to put here. I'm like, all right, you're right. Because it's comedy. Um, so I think that there, there's a balance to it, you know, on, on either side. I think for me right now, it's just the reclamation of self. And I think for stand up also for me is just kind of like a self confidence thing. I hadn't really thought about it this way till we were kind of getting more in this conversation. But I think even in sketch, I could still hide behind other people's words and ideas. And no, I wasn't conscious of like, that's what I was doing. I still love sketch more than anything. But um, I think that's the thing about comedy is it really asks me, Rachel, like, how do you see the world? So that's like the first thing. And then the second thing is like, okay, now how do we make that funny? And because there's not really any other medium where that's what we're asked to do. So, um, I mean, it's still stand up for me. It's still really like, a one woman show. I mean, that's really the format much more than like stand up punchline, stand up punchline, which was why I even lost my confidence a little bit with, cause I only started doing stand up because I O closed. I right. just didn't, I just didn't have anywhere else to get on stage. And I was like, I've been on stage five nights a week for 15 years of my life. Like, what do I do? Um, so 
Well, yeah. that's an interesting thing, you know, getting back to, oh God, man, I get, getting back to our, our brief touch on, uh, you know, God or spirituality, but it's like, and I hate this phrase, you know, everything happens for a reason. Like, sure. That's, that's not good to hear when you're in the middle of the everything happening, you know, uh -huh. don't, don't tell me about the reason when everything is happening, you know? Yeah. Uh, but the, I, you know, and, and just to brief, you know, that, that's where you and I met and that's, that's where I, you know, th through a lot of luck and happenstance and who knows, you know, divine intervention, that's where I landed almost immediately when I got to, um, Los Angeles. And I, even though I'm from the Chicago area, I had never done anything at second city or IO Chicago. Um, but it, it crapped out, you know, unceremoniously kind of unfairly in 2018. And I, like everyone, you know, mourned that and it was really too bad, but, uh, you know, I, I, I as I said earlier, I, I got into my acting classes in 2019 and, um, you know, I think this is another really overwrought phrase, but, you know, I found a community, you know, I mean, I, I didn't really need one. I didn't need any more friends, but I've met some really wonderful people through that class. I only did it for about nine months or so, or maybe close to a year, but I have a, you know, a friend that, you know, we, we go see a movie, um, you know, with, with the American cinema tech every month or every two months, you know, my, my friend Alexis is, is my, my late night zoom self tape, co-reader, you know? Um, so I've, I've locked in some really beautiful friendships from that. It made me a better actor. It influenced my ability to book a few roles. Finally, um, you know, you, you shifted into stand up. Um, I'm trying to think of other people who sort of, you know, pivoted, you know, some, some folks ended up landing at other theaters, which they like. So that's cool. But like, I was, you know, something I think about a lot in, in my career and, you know, looking back on my life and, and sometimes being sad or frustrated at where my career is or isn't is like, you know, I was kind of, I was complacent, you know, and like the, the IO was good enough. And um, my, my first agents who really only got me out for commercial auditions, that was good enough. And I didn't, I guess I didn't, and maybe this was influenced by, you know, my, my, uh, my, my drinking and, and my, my social, you know, habits in my twenties, but I was, I was happy with things just being good enough. And I didn't chase or seek after things or, or, you know, really hustle. I didn't hustle. I don't have the hustle for stand up. I certainly don't have it now living in the suburbs, being almost 40 with a baby on the way, but I didn't have it when I was 25 either. It's just not something I was really into. Um, so the IO closing was an end of an era and really broke all of our hearts. But for me personally, um, and again, it, it kind of felt this way, even in the moment I was like, okay, what's next? You know, th this chapter is unequivocally closed and over with. Do I want to just mourn it for five years or do I want to find what's next for me? Um, and that's something I think about routinely and I've never really had a chance to express it. So I just did. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love that so much. And I, you know, um, I obviously have a lot of deep spiritual practices for myself as I define them. And I've been, like I said, going back to where we started this, the episode of, you know, I've had a couple days to myself to actually like, huh like think and breathe. And, um, I've been thinking a lot about, I'm like, what are those kind of losses of things that I still need to grieve? Like, I don't think I really, you know, I mean, Redford was so important to me, even though we all fought all the time and everybody, we know it's like, <laughs> interesting. Start, you know, like we'd go, we'd get out of a meeting and, you know, Tim and Bill were yelling at each other. And then Owen and I would go out to smoke a cigarette and we're like, what's going on? You know? And, everybody's wow, really you know, oh yeah because you know we're all very big personalities and I mean but it felt like being a part of a family I'm an only child I never was a part of that where people fight and they come back together and they love each other anyway I had never experienced that before and it felt even different than it did at Second City because at Second City it was still always like you and they did this by design of like, everyone is your competition. They don't say that, but that was like a lot of the ethos. And 
I didn't feel that way with IO. It was like, we were all respected how talented each other were. We were grateful that everybody kept showing up. And I think we really enjoyed each other and, and what each other brought to the table. And so I think, you know, with that and, uh, similarly, I got let go from my agents in 2019. I think we had the same agent. Oh and- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, he was just trying to make a buck and keep his job. So, hey, man, you know, and I, I, get I, ne- it. I never took that personally. Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. And he was so wonderful when he called me. But, you know, and even at that time, I mean, I had just gotten sober. I went through a big breakup that was monumental. I, you know, when I got dropped by my agent, it, I mean, for me at that time, again, everything happens for a reason. It's like, don't tell me that right now. But, I knew that I was in a pivotal shift. And I think because so many losses were coming so quickly, I didn't have time to fully process and grieve or even like give gratitude for how influential each of those things were on my life. And then, you know, all of a sudden it's 2020 and I'm married and then I'm pregnant and then we have a baby and then, okay, now we're going to move and now we move and then we have another baby and then we renovate our house. And it's kind of like now coming out of that where my youngest is one, it's like, okay, we made it through that. We're here now. And it feels like kind of all the dust is settled. It's almost like the rocket went off and like, all right, the fuselage has gone off and now we're just floating. And it's like, oh, okay. In orbit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's like, okay, you know what next? And, um, you know, my husband and I are opening a production studio and hopefully comedy venue, if we can find a space big enough. Wow. Um, so yeah, so that's been like, we've been putting, you know, work into that for two years and putting the money away and figuring it out. And so we're, we're buying a building. That's like what we're in the process of doing, um, to start this. And so I take so much of that with me because I have no idea what this next journey is going to be like, or even if this venture will work, maybe we'll do it for six months and be like, Oh, this isn't what we want to do. And it'll be what it's supposed to be. But I think just thank you for having this conversation with me because it's just really warmed that the the comedic part of me that's like but we're anything can happen and anything is possible and i think it's so rare when we get back to that very pure place and i think i really need that mentality as we move into this next thing and it's actually funny because the building is called the orbit so it's funny you're just like oh like you're in orbit oh, okay. like yeah um because our, our production company is called skewed orbit skewed orbit yeah yeah um okay. so our uh yeah so our space will be called the orbit and hopefully yeah cool. atlanta can you know orbit around this comedy theater so so we'll see i've already greased the wheels i've talked to redford i'm like hey if you guys get real bored you guys can always come down for a weekend and we can do a best of run for a weekend if i can get everybody to uh to come down and do it but uh yeah so i don't know we'll see that's that's what i've kind of been working on behind the scenes and then this podcast has kind of been like my backgammon uh zine just a place to yeah exercise and talk to people that i i i really admire and i respect like yourself and just kind of catching up with with different people and and hearing different perspectives and um yeah This has just been really nice. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. I mean, you know, like I said, I was was an early adopter of the podcast. I was very very much an always sunny in Philadelphia type experience with me and your 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 first podcast episodes. And then I kind of dropped off because I'm not a uh, podcast guy for the most part. But um, I was very flattered to be asked to do this. I've been waiting for the chance (laughs) for many years. (laughs) Yeah, this was um, perfect. And you're about to be a dad. Yeah, yeah. We're in our 30, we're, we're in our, we're at 38 weeks. So we're in our 39th week. So, oh my uh, goodness. Congratulations. Thank you. It's right around the corner. We we organized the nursery furniture layout today. So oh, big day. Yeah, we're making moves. Um, So yeah, it's a girl and uh, we have a name and um. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I guess I feel, yeah, I do feel good. I feel excited. Um, yeah. and I don't, you know, I, I know I'm in for a whole, uh, you know, an upheaval, you know, on, on every level, but, um, it's really just kind of one thing at a time, you know, one day at a time, 
uh, one diaper at a time. You know, the, the, the only thing I really can let myself think about and I can really sort of group into, you know, a, a, a timeline or a time frame is like the actual labor and delivery. You know, yeah. I'm, of course, I want everybody to be healthy through that. Um, and I'm kind of wondering like when it's going to happen because nowadays, like they encourage you, unless your water breaks, they encourage the women to stay home for as long as possible. So we're just going to be like, you know, plowing through some Sopranos apps while my, my wife is in labor, you know? Um, but, uh, but yeah, but part of that I'm sure is sort of avoidance and I'm just not, you know, arrested development and I'm not ready. And I'm like, what is uh, I, can't, I can't do this. I gotta get out of here. But most of it's like, I, I can't control much and I can't tell the future. So I just got to kind of do one thing at a time. And today that was unboxing our glider chair. I love it. I love it so much. And that's, I, I mean, it's the very real raw reality that, I mean, even it's like, my second time around. And I was like, okay, I've already done this. I even know. And I was still like, well, maybe just the baby will just walk out and I won't have to push him out. <laughs> or like, you know, there it's, it is such a similar to, you know, to the opposite of, of birth is death. And there's something so, and this sounds trite, but like for lack of a better word, profound, because it's two sides of the coin that we don't know what happens on the other side, where somebody comes in and where someone goes. And it's, it is the, it, it's just a really magical, wild, messy, crazy time, but I'm so excited for y'all and it's going to be so wonderful. And that's always my biggest, I don't ever, there's not a lot that I don't give advice about if you can believe that. Um, but one is people that are about to have kids or thinking about having kids. I'm like, whatever's right for you, man, you're going to figure it out because it is such a thing that's so universal. And at the same time, it comes to each of us in totally different ways. But my biggest piece of advice is always that of like, it's totally fine to space out. And like, like as long as like your ducks are in a row, right? Which it sounds like it is. It's like, just, you could just space out and just enjoy all of these last moments to yourself and act as though this will just always be what it is because why not? I'm getting in a lot of backgammon. Yeah. I'm I'm going to my backgammon clubs. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it's undeniable uh, that it is, it is profound. You know, I, I'm, I, and I've heard many, you know, men say, you know, something just changes, you know, when you finally see that, that little person's face for the first time, you know, and I believe that, but I also think on my wedding day, I thought that I might be one of those people who like cries, you know, on the altar. Um, and, you know, not for any bad reason, obviously. And when I finally, you know, I had to kind of turn around and um, we did, we had an outdoor ceremony. So I had to sort of essentially, you know, look the other way until my wife was sort of like, you know, where she needed to be because we didn't do a first look thing or anything. And when I turned around, I was seized by this sense of security mm -hmm. and safety. And I was sort of uh, strengthened and empowered by her uh, presence. And so instead of feeling, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, sort of weak or, you know, as, as if my hard exterior was, was melting and I, I start sobbing tears of joy, I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. And it was a feeling that like, you know, for as much as I love her and we, we were getting married, you know, it was the right decision. It was a, a new, uh, completely unexpected, you know, uh, emotion that I felt in that moment. So I suspect I will cry when I meet this child, but I don't know, you know, maybe. And, and that's the whole point. Why even bother thinking about it? I, I know it's going to be profound, but I don't know what profound looks like until it's already there. So, um, yeah. Like I said, I'm just nudging the crib, you know, six inches at a time one way or the other today. Yeah, I love that. I love that so much. Well, um, so I did not tell you this at the beginning, but I will already do an intro uh, for you, a proper intro. So the podcast won't have just started uh, like when we just started talking today. But is there... Uh, is there anything that you want to promote? Like, can we find your zine on like your website or like if people wanted to learn more about you or your work or anything like that, where, where would you direct us? 
Uh, I would direct you to Instagram. Uh, you know, my my personal handle is uh, at Mr. Druska, and Mr. is spelled out M I S T E R D R U S K A. Um, when I have you know showbiz stuff or or performances or that sort of thing, I'll I'll I throw it up there. I'm really proud of my my side Instagram hustles. So the the main backgammon page is at Pure Backgammon. And then the zine has its own. It's at tableaus underscore esoterica. Um, and tableau is, is like French, T-A-B-L-E-A-U-X. Um, so, yeah, that's that. And I have an IMDb and I am, am still in the acting game and the writing game. So uh, if anybody wants to read one of those 15 features, um, you can holler at me on Instagram. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, we will link all of those in the show notes, including your IMDb, because I'm sure somebody will be curious. So they can go and check that out. Um, but seriously, from just the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. This was so much fun. And I'm so glad we were able to make it happen. And um, yeah, I'm so excited for the birth of your daughter. And uh, yeah, we'll touch base not too long from now. And I'll have to hear how it all went. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, my my pleasure, Rachel. I've I've always uh, admired your your um, talent, and I'm glad that we're friends, uh, even after all these, you know, changes and all this time has gone by. So I'm I'm really honored to be here, and it's it's really nice to have, um, uh, you know, a meaningful conversation about something that we don't talk about in these terms very often. Oof. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you. All right. See you. Did I tell you or did I tell you? I told you. I told you. That was fun. You never knew. You had no idea that we were going to talk about backgammon. You had no idea. Neither did I. Neither did I. Uh, so all of John's links, all of that good stuff are in the show notes. So if you're interested and you want to check that out, his zine, the other uh, new projects he's got going on Instagram, please go and check that out. Again, he's going to be coming back to the podcast. So I'm excited for that. If you are hearing this, Tired Mom has dropped on YouTube. That's right. My new half hour uh, comedy special is out on YouTube. So you can go to the Rachel Force on YouTube. Check that out. If you haven't subscribed, what's going on? Subscribe to my YouTube channel, baby. Uh, on there, you can check out the full half hour of Tired Mom. You can check that out. I'm getting ready to be in Boston in June. So if you're in the greater uh Boston area, Massachusetts, New York, can you take a train in? Come and say hello. So all the details for that will be rolling out probably next week. So uh, stay tuned for all of that. Again, if you like this podcast, the best gift you can give me, seriously, just tell somebody. Tell somebody. Can you post about it? Can you post about it? Even better, baby. Okay? If you want to do a pod swap, let me know. I'm not above it. Okay? All right. All the good things for everything else that's going on, you can check the links in the stories or in the stories in the show notes here. Uh, and yeah, I've still got spots open. If you want to do a spiritual misfit path reading with me, or if you want to get my eye on something, I do have some creative eye spots open and available, and I would love to work with you. All right. If you haven't jumped on that newsletter, we got a lot of stuff coming out this summer. And if you're having fun, if you feel like this is working for you, I highly encourage you to check that out because we're doing big things and I would love for you to be a part of it. All right. Sound good. Stay in it. Stay light. Love you. Mean it. Time, weather, and... Highways! Pass.